I am Amy Pilling. I work producing these lasers for SciArt Santa Fe. We are a group of artists and science scientists. Um, Susan Latham and Dr. Andrea Poli are largely responsible for our group formation and our presence and our activities in association with Leonardo, the International Society for the Arts, Sciences, and Technology. So I want to thank Susan and uh, Dr. Poli for making this happen. Uh, Santa Fe is a small nonprofit in Santa Fe. And again, we do mostly educational and art science integrated work. Uh, I would like to introduce Susan Latham. Uh, Susan has been working tirelessly to create opportunities for artists and scientists to get together and uh, share ideas and talk. She is, uh, I, I think one of the more inspiring people I've met. She's an artist and she's incredibly enthusiastic about this mission. So uh, Susan has a long history of education and curriculum development in the arts and sciences. She's uh, really gotten quite a lot done in her life. So the more I've gotten to know Susan, the more impressed I am with her. So I'm gonna keep it short, but uh, if you get a chance, I'll put Susan's website up on, on chat too, and you can learn a little bit more about her. And Susan, uh, I'm going to pass it on to you, but I think you're muted, so you're going to have to unmute. There we go. Hello, hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Gary tonight. Gary Lee Nelson is a classically tra trained composer. He founded and chaired the Technology and Music and Related Arts Department in the Conservatory of Music at Oberlin College, pronounced tomorrow. At the 1978 International Computer Music Conference, he was honored as a pioneer in the field. His travels have taken him to Asia, Australia, Europe, including Moscow. Nelson retired to Santa Fe in 2010 to be and to become. In a city different, he has taught at the Santa Fe University for Art and Design and the New Mexico School for the Arts. Today, he will be talking about merging math and art. Take it away, Gary. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for it. Nice introduction. Yeah, I will be talking about mathematical techniques that I've used to make my music uh, and, and films and still art. I'm going to try, try to keep things up on the screen that you can watch while I'm talking. Keep the sound down on this one. In an interview, French composer and electronic music pioneer Edgar Varese's work was characterized as experimental. He corrected the interview saying, these are not experiments, these are results. The experiments are scattered over the floor of my studio. Tonight I'm gonna to use a format from early TV when a songwriter sat down at a piano and simply said, and then I wrote. My time is limited, so I'm gonna ask my studio manager, Allison, she's going to try to help me stay on track. I've asked her to read some portions of my script while I run the board. Here, take it away, Allison. Pleased to meet you all. And I'm gonna turn that sound completely off. And here's some more from Allison describing some of my earliest work. We are listening to Circuit, my very first electronic composition. 1964 to 1966, in the Netherlands at the Institute of Sinology of Utrecht University. Although they were beginning to use computers they were not yet ready. All of my source sounds were created on tape with various lab hardware, oscillators, and filters. Many of the sounds were recorded from unused radio bands that broadcast various colors of noise, lots of tape splicing. The final mix was made with a bank of tape recorders playing at varying speeds into a stereo mix. It was a blend of the two major approaches to electronic music then current, the French music concrete of Pierre Schaeffer, and the German electronic music of Karl-Heinz Stockhausen. 
Synology had devotees of both schools. I was chastised for not taking sides, but then I was there only one day a week. By the way Gary, what were you doing in Amsterdam? Let me turn the page here. I'm going to talk about uh, seedable random numbers. Those are the first computer techniques that I used. And again, Ali is going to uh, describe it. From the beginning, I wanted to automate complicated musical structure and texture. The solution seemed to be random numbers. On the computer, we call them pseudo-random because, in fact, they are the result of traveling through a giant circle that includes all possible numbers in a complicated pattern, that deceives human perception. In addition, I wanted to duplicate my results when I found something I liked. This is done with a seed that tells the computer where to start on the circle. Once seeded, the sequence of events would be as complicated as I wished but repeatable by resetting the seed. With this music, I'm getting the seeds from my Yamaha keyboard. Each key triggers a, a different phrase. Here's middle C. And if I press it again, it repeats it exactly. Another technique I've been using is uh, nonlinear dynamics using the logistic map. The popular term for this is chaos. It's similar to randomness, but its output is different. And let me kill this image. The output is different. Um, and I'm on the wrong page here. There we are. I'm going to show you a, a little tutorial that I wrote to help my students understand this. Um, here's, the, here's the graph of the, uh, the chaos graph. I'm going to start with a little bit of music here. So this is, uh, this is just some music that's playing that, uh, uh, from that graph. There's a conductor. And he's conducting here at 120, and a harp is playing every beat, 100% of them. And if I reduce, reduce that to 50, what I've done is reduce the, uh, the uh, horizontal density, the number of notes that are played within a certain period of time. And now here's a string orchestra, also playing 50% of the notes. And every note is held for four beats, so all of these are whole notes. And if I change them to eighth notes, reduce the vertical density, that's just how many notes are sounding at a certain time. And so these things two together uh, are describing musical texture. Now let's hear some percussion. Now we'll talk about this graph. There's a slider along this graph. Its name is R. And the further you go to the right, the more complicated things get. And I'm, at, I'm in this area right now, or perhaps this area, where there are only four possible notes. And I'm going to move this R graph to the other end. Much more complicated. To get back to the simple part, 
Listen to it carefully. There's repetition, but it's not always exact. There are different things that happen, and this is a very advantageous property of this uh, particular process. So I think I'll close this up. Now I have a piece that I made with, uh, with this. It's a piece for solo marimba. And it was composed for a, a student of mine, Deborah Moore. She played it on her Oberlin Junior recital. And maybe I'll turn that up a bit. Now notice the alternating patterns and the repeated notes. And this is at the simple end of the chaos, or at least the interesting part of it. And the form of this piece is simply sliding the R slider from beginning from where it is now, but the most complex. And here's a bit from page seven. And we can see immediately that the notes are all over the place, very angular, almost no repetition. Now another topic is uh, Markov chains. And in the early 20th century, there was a group of composers in Vienna. I call them the triple A. It was uh, Arnold Schoenberg, Alban Berg, and Anton Webern. And this is the tone row for Be uh, Webern's Opus 7 piano variations. And if we look across, if I can get my mouse up there, if we look across this, this is called the original form. It uses the notes of the 12 tone scale exactly once each, and they create it so that there are intervals in it that give it some character. And so here's what the original sounds like. And then if you play it backwards, now turn your attention over to column, the first column, and if I play that downward, I'm playing what's called the inversion. Now we look here, and this it goes up a step from C to C sharp, and here it goes C to B natural. So this is a, an inversion. And then the fourth form is to play up that column. And that is the retrograde inversion. Now let's hear a little bit of, of that played by uh, Glenn Gould, I think, is playing this. It's very soft. And Webern is also known for his sparseness and his brevity. Some of his pieces are, I think there's one that's only seven seconds long. Okay, let's go back to that graph. Whoops. There we go. A Markov chain is, this is kind of an example of a Markov chain. Um, I've written a number of pieces with, with that, and I'm going to start one that's called Magic Square. And my version, a version of it is not just 12 notes, but any, any number I want, and repeating, so that it becomes kind of a melody. And I don't know if you notice that those four different versions, they had a certain similarity to them. And so, what I do with my Markov chain is I, I start anywhere and I move in some direction and then I reach a point and I flip a coin that's weighted against heads, but if it turns out to be heads, I get to turn in some direction, this way, that way, even diagonally. And that's what this piece is all about. Now, last Halloween, I was invited to a party where we were supposed to read a scary poem or story so I choose to use this piece, uh, and you'll recognize the story. Let me turn the page here, and we'll turn it up a bit. In the year 2525, if man is still alive, if woman can survive, they may find a world different than from now. 
different yet not knowing how. Now I'll skip a few verses. In the year 6565, no need for husbands, no need for wives. You'll pick your son and daughter too from the bottom of a long glass tube. And then to the end, now it's been 10,000 years. Man has cried a trillion tears. For what? He never knew. And now his reign is through. Yet in the dark eternal night, there's still the twinkling starry light. So very, very far away. And there, perhaps, it's yesterday. Another area that I've explored is fractals. Uh, here's a clip from uh, NPR program where they uh, interview me about fractals and fractal music. Well, fractals in general involve mathematics. Almost all fractals can finally be represented as a series of numbers. And if you were to use those numbers to produce graphic images, you would get kind of digital paintings. If you interpret the numbers as musical elements, melody, harmony, rhythm, then the result would be called fractal music, or music derived from fractal mathematics. There's a real-life analogy to fractals that I think most people have experienced, or at least observed. Imagine you're sitting in a barber shop and you're looking at your image in a mirror. Of course, you see yourself, but you also see your reflection from the mirror on the opposite wall. And those reflections are moving back and forth out to infinity. So this is a simple process and a simple input. Your image is the input, the process of the reflecting mirrors. And the complex result is this pattern of images that goes off and shrinking in size until they kind of disappear from sight. Now we've been hearing uh, through this fractal mountains, I'll turn it up just a little bit. And this graphic is an explanation of how we're doing this. I, I start to make my mountain with two solid lines. So we have the ski lift up and the slalom down. You split it someplace in the center and pull it out, pull it out. And now you've got four lines instead of two. And there's the second subdivision and the third subdivision. And when we get to the fourth subdivision, it's time to make some music. So we now have a melodic contour through a phrase. And at each vertex, I take whatever number is there and make it a pitch, and then I stretch it out to make a duration. And now, and we're, we're still listening to Fractal Mountains. This piece is a microtonal with 96 tones per octave instead of the usual 12. And here's what it would sound like on the piano. Gary, is it possible to turn it up a little bit? Is that better? Can you still hear me? Yes. Good. Now, I notice it's incredibly out of tune. And one of the reasons that we probably find that objectionable is that we associate the piano sound with its tuning. And so we've taken it pretty far from the norm. Now let's go back to the electronic version. And in this, most people wouldn't think it's out of tune at all. It might not even occur to them because the instruments are unfamiliar and the combination makes, as I intended, a rather a mellow composition. I've also been working with sonification, and uh, Ali will tell us about that. Sonification is the creation of non-speech audio for information analysis. For music, the numbers are translated into pitch, rhythm, volume, stereo position and timbre. Each pixel in a JPEG image has six numeric values. The XY position yield information for pitch and rhythm. I use the RGB values to place sound in a stereo space. Bright red pixels are on the right, green on the left, and yellow in the middle. 
blue is introduced for quadraphonic projection. Brightness also determines loudness. To play the image, I scan from left to right like a piano roll. And what we're looking at is the score. And here is the image that it came from. This is a wonderful image uh, by Aaron Bielish. Uh, he's an art and music instructor at Lone Star uh, College in uh, Kingwood, Texas. We'll look at a few features of this. Uh, I don't know if he intended this to be a face, but it looks like a face to me. There's an eye and a nose, uh, mouth, chin, and maybe there are two more noses. I'm not sure what's going on here. But this is a feature to keep in mind when we see the next thing, which is the sonification and the animation of this image. Again, using this as the score. And on the right, you can see animation that's similar to the image. And then this blue and green is part of those, uh, I don't know what, what to call them. It's, it looks a little bit like a claw. And it's sweeping up through here as it, as it goes as well. Now, this is typical of uh, a number of things that I've done. I've done some still images. Uh, I call them evolutionary digital images. And I'm going to start a montage of those images. And I, I make them in families of 16. And to make them more easily experienced, I created slideshows for each family and composed soundtracks that complement the images. My first family was called Oiseau Mystique. And the soundtrack is made from nature sounds, birds chirping, water running, occasional woodpecker. And the image that started this is a simple outline of a bird, which you can see in several places. You can also see the wing. There's a very clear bird at the bottom. Teardrops is a memorial to the victims of the Charlie Hebdo massacre in Paris in 2015. The soundtrack is meant to portray a, a sense of wandering sadness. Here's another one that's animated, Shadow Man. Shadow Man uses some photographs of me and my derby and cane taken in the evening lights of downtown Santa Fe. Shadow Man comes on nights of the full moon. We dropped some stills into Photoshop and created abstractions, sometimes including, including multiple His images. appearance is unpredictable in time or place. And I animated the abstractions in two layers. He has no mission or intent. And then I composed music and wrote dialogue to tell the story of this uh, mystical character. He is neither good nor evil. Neither god nor demon. And by the way, this is Allison's grandfather that's doing the narrating. Huh? And moving on, another system that I've found useful and attractive is called Lindenmeyer systems or L systems. And I'm going to play just in the background here a little bit of the piece that I'll talk about in more detail in a second. I'm going to make that a little soft while I talk. Lindenmeyer systems use characters and letters to, for drawing instructions. 
So the initiator, this equilateral triangle, F says draw a line of a certain length into a particular place. Plus means turn to the right, minus means turn to the left. So the program to draw this equilateral triangle is F plus plus F plus plus F. And the turning angle is 60 degrees, so that's why we need two of those. Then we look at the generator. Shortly, it's going to replace the three lines of the equilateral triangle with F minus F plus plus F minus F. And when it does, we get the Star of David on the right. And this is also recursive. So we do it again. We get this. We get this. We get this. And this is the Coke snowflake. It's the classical example of uh, Lindenmeyer systems. Now let's look at the one I used to make this piece that we're hearing. Figure five is something called a space filling curve. I'm not going to talk about that much. And it's the Hilbert curve. Now this piece is called Gauss because in the beginning I thought it was the Gosper curve, but one of my mathematician friends said, no, nope, it's Hilbert. Well, I kept the title because I can't have the piece called Hilb. Figure six, I decided, uh, well, one of the rules of the space filling curve is lines can't cross. Well, I violated that with an angle of about, well, a prime number near 100 degrees. And notice in the lower left-hand corner of this figure, the lines are longer than they are in the upper right hand. And then I unraveled that and got this graph that is actually the melodic contour of the piece. Now we can look at it in score. The Zeta violin is an electronic violin or an acoustic violin with an electronic circuit that can be plugged into the computer. So the computer knows what notes are being played. There's a scale, and uh, Mark Litwin is the violinist. He has a pedal. If he presses the pedal, the computer takes the note he's playing and works down through the scale, skipping notes to make a chord. Now, it's very similar to what we would do with a, with a traditional scale. We'd make a major chord by skipping notes, minor chord the same. Then he's got another pedal. When he presses that, you'll hear it in just a moment here. And there, that sound. That's actually a quotation from Fractal Mountains. Now let's take a trip to the Milky Way. Allison, uh, tell us about this image. The seed image for this film is from an article about what a new telescope has found. The Milky Way has a turbulent center with nearly 1,000 mysterious strands, inexplicably dangling in space. It's about the work of Professor Farhad Youssef Zadeh at Northwestern Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research in Astrophysics. The animation technique is the same as described earlier. Now I learned about this research just a couple of weeks ago. I scored the film with singing voices to uh, symbolize the distance between us and the galaxies. We humans seem fascinated with the vastness of space while our minuscule egos try to convince us that we really matter in the grand scheme of things. And this is also animated on two layers. Then a few days ago, I ran across a poem by a Finnish author, Zacharias Topelius. I've been moving in the direction of storytelling with my films. This poem seems to be a good uh, companion for these images. I'll read a bit of it. All the lamps have been put out, and now the night is hushed and clear, and all the memories of vanished days return and reappear, and 
Tender legends flit about like gleams amid the blue, until with sad and wondrous joy the heart remembers too. The limpid stars look downward in the winter midnight's glow, with blissful smile as if no death were known on earth below. Can you discern their muffled speech? I'll tell you if I may, the tale the stars once told to me about the Milky Way. This film is about seven minutes long and there are about 10 more verses like that. And the title is gonna be from that last line, a tale the stars once told to me about the Milky Way. Another interesting algorithm is called flocking. Um, let's look on, uh, on the internet for some examples of this. And here it is in nature. This is not my music, by the way. And these lovely fluid forms are made just by each bird having a certain set of behaviors that keeps them close to their neighbors. And the mathematical simulation looks like this. We joke that the, the person that came up with this algorithm was probably born in Brooklyn because he called it Boyd's. The flocking algorithm is a mathematical model of the movement of flocks of birds, herds of mammals and schools of fish. It imitates the rules that govern the relationships between members of the group. I broke most of the rules in creating my dance of the planets. My film Progeny, nine planets roam the insides of another giant planet. I gave them a set of behaviors. Near the end, they gather in a three-by-three three formation before emerging and fading away. The geography is created by wrapping the globes with the circular paintings of Ohio artist, Christine Gorbach. They are mostly black and white with bits of yellow and red. White makes continents. Black makes oceans and the colors become occasional flashes of lightning. The oceans are transparent. There are numbers in the coordinates and rotations that are used to make the music. Now we move on to something called granular synthesis. Granular synthesis is the sonic equivalent of pointillism in painting. This music that we're hearing is made from small particles of sound. It's an early piece of mine called particulation. I'm using granular synthesis in a project called The Dying of the Light. It's based on a, a familiar poem by Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. I'm also using, I'm gonna turn this down a little bit. I'm also using uh, granular for a dramatic effect where Dylan's voice wanders in and out of intelligibility. 
There's a slider I can, where I can control the sonic equivalent of focus. The granulator breaks Dylan's speech into small particles that can be scattered at various distances from the words as he speaks them. And the closer the grains come back to home, the clearer the speech. And yet another process. Start a video here. And turn the audio up on this one. Cross composition was the name I gave to this process before a mathematician uh, friend uh, told me that what I'm actually doing is called convolution. Convolution is an operation where two functions are joined to produce a third that expresses how the shapes of one modifies the shapes of the other. In 2002, I made a film called Death and Transfiguration that was inspired by the tone poem of Richard Strauss, a great tuba part, by the way. I superimposed Strauss's pitches, melodies, and harmonies on a fractal rhythms and textures with an electronic orchestra of my own design. The animation was made with black and white photos that I took of things dead in nature. In architectural terms, the fractal provides the beams and the struts, while the Strauss pitches are responsible for the interior decorations. Now let's visit a concert hall in Vienna. This is where Strauss celebrates the climactic moment of the glorious Street minor chord suspension. And here's that moment in my film. climactic point, I freeze the frame on some crocuses newly blossomed to symbolize the moment of transfiguration. And there it is. Then after a moment of hope, the music turns pensive the thought that life may not be truly a circle. And here's another one of my slideshows. This one's called Los Manos. And the seed image is a, a pair of praying hands. Spanish flavor, I uh, scored it with some Cuban percussion. Then last week I made another uh, example of musical convolution that I called Gustav in Habana. The surface is Mars from Gustav whole suite, the planets played at quadruple speed with the notes assigned to another band of virtual Cubans. Here is Gustav in Havana. Superhuman drummers. The surface is Mars from Gustav Holt's suite and the planets, and it's played at quadruple speed.
And here's the ending. Again, this is called convolution. It's the combining of two things to make a third thing. Now, I've referred several times to my early ambition to be spend my life as an orchestral tuba player. Let me get ready for this to go here. The core of that desire never really went away. In the mid-1980s, I returned to live performance with something called the MIDI horn. This is from a PBS program about new instruments, which, which of, they, of course they called experimental instruments. The piece is called Quintessence. I use a modest mathematics for this one. I did everything I could think of with the numbers one through five. Now we'll continue this piece while I talk about the MIDI horn. Now I ignore the text, so I'll just talk about the, uh, the figures. The front of the horn has eight keys. The top four are the same fingerings as a four valve tuba. The next three are the fingerings of a trumpet, but instead of dropping semitones, they drop octaves. So the instrument has an eight octave range. The little key down here is like a shift key that with which I can use all eight key or all seven keys to pick an instrument from the MIDI uh, set of instruments. Here's the back, it has two joysticks, one for each thumb, and besides those are buttons that can be reached by the thumbs. And the buttons are highly programmable. There's one piece that I play a solo kind of thing and then I hit that button when I want the accompaniment to join in. I'll keep that playing for a little while. I composed a 90-minute program of pieces for myself and took them on tour for more than two decades. The music was weird, but the concerts were well received. Here's a, here's a piece called Refractions. This was commissioned by the uh, Prism Saxophone Quartet, and they played it on some Yamaha WX7 uh, electronic wind instruments that came on the market about three years after the MIDI horn, uh, which was never on the market, never will be. And encores weren't uh, uncommon. Here's one that I like to play. Of course, it's Saint Saens, the Swan from the Carnival of the Animals. I added this video, it's just kind of silly. Swans are not very friendly. I was attacked by one in a parking lot next to a lake in uh, Michigan. And this one is pretty protective about his pond, he doesn't want any Canada geese in it. Here's a piece I'll start. This is a piece by Thomas Morley from 1585. It's from a book of his called A Plain and Easy Introduction to the Art and Craft of Music. And he wrote it to uh, demonstrate the, 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 where you could go with prolation, something that he called that we would now call mixed meters and subdivisions of beats. 
And throughout this, I'm just playing this tune that you hear on the top. I just play it over and over while my uh, two friends accompanying just get crazier and crazier. Here we are toward the end of the piece. And I'm playing on a trumpet now. And now a different instrument. Now we're going to return to outer space. Allie, can you tell us a little bit about the history of this? In 2014, I performed wanderings, musings about time and space, at Currents, an international festival of new media that takes place in Santa Fe each summer. Both audio and video were created from the pixels in photographs from the Hubble telescope. This is the Red Skull. The images are treated as a kind of piano roll where the positions and colors of the pixels are mapped into musical parameters. There are 20 videos, each with its own galaxy and a duration of one minute. Here is the animation The Red Skull with soundtrack. And the soundtrack is indeed there. Outer Space is a film I made recently with the materials from 2014. I plan to use it in live performance while I read from the wandering script. It explores time and space, eternity and infinity with jokes. The monologue opens this way. I was trying to daydream but my mind kept wandering. It's been so long since I did anything that mattered. I want to be original. I want to be new. But few human thoughts are unique. Only true geniuses create from scratch. More often we just notice what others have done and wonder how we might turn their efforts to our own needs and purposes. We just watch what passes by an act out of curiosity, necessity, or whimsy. Ultimately, everything we do is derivative. Maybe I should just write a nice little song. The song's been on my mind. Nothing fancy. Let's save it for us. Maybe it'll find a place in your mind. The things we know, we know, we know. The things we know, we don't know. Some things we know, we know, we know. The things we know, we know. No one else is well known. Well, the long quest for man. The what we know, we shall show. The things we know, we don't know. The things we know, we know, we know. We do the best we can. I stole that from Donald Rumsfeld. If you were born since 1970, you know what the law is. We think, we think, we thought, and thoughts, we thought of laughter. So thoughts, we thought, we thought before, and thoughts, we thought of laughter. Thinking thoughts is what we do, and thoughts we think won't think up. And what we think, we think is true, till life gives us a finger.
That's it. Thank you, Gary. If anyone has questions uh, and you want to ask them in chat um, or we can unmute, what would you prefer, Gary? Uh, maybe in chat. I hope there's some questions. <laughs> yeah, feel free to ask questions. Hmm. Well, let's see. Now I have some questions. Where the heck is chat? Anything specific you'd like to know about any of these things I've covered? Yeah, I, I'm, I can't find chat. <laughs> Go ahead and ask verbally, Susan. Well, Gary, <clears throat> I'm wondering, you know, what we did, we saw very small images of the art that you were talking about. I mean, I'll, I'll just say art, it's images, videos, whatever the combination was. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I, I'm just wondering, when you've been out in the world in, in your profession, have you been showing these videos as, you know, at, because we didn't really get to see that much, but oh, I'm wondering okay. that uh, because the, the music and the images together blown up like on a big screen, have, did you do that? Have you done that? Yeah, um, let me play a little bit of that last thing. I'll do it with without. Can you uh, make that window bigger on the left? Yeah, I'm going to play that last that last song without the sound. And can you see it? You see the screen behind me? Uh, I just see the 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 arc of the planet. Oh well, that, then... that's that's me. Are you looking on the shared screen? Are people not, did no one see the shared screen? Shared screen. Yeah, we're seeing it. Oh, okay. Well, well that, that screen behind me, this was performed at uh, uh, Currents down in the rail yard on their stage. And so I had uh, that screen behind me and these, uh, the sounds and the images were being controlled by a little, uh, it's actually an iPad in my hand there. I had a little control panel on it. So I could bring certain images in. And what you're seeing now is the background screen. So that was pretty large. The audience was about 200 people. Gary, um, you do have some questions in chat that are coming okay, in. Okay, yeah. Should I Let, read them to you? Sure. Uh, Mark Neyrink, who is an astronomer, said, could you say a bit more about what and how you were doing the Milky Way filament piece? Uh, yeah, let me, let me return to that. Uh, okay scroll down my screens here a bit. Yeah, this is something I read a, an article and I can't remember what the, uh, yeah, here it is. Um, let, let me put the video up while we're talking about that. Well, first of all, here's, here's the still image. This is what was in the article. And this is a group from Northwestern. Maybe you didn't hear the, uh, I don't know if the, the man might be watching now. This is a picture they took with a, they didn't identify the telescope, but they said it was a new one, so it must have been the web. And they said they looked inside the Milky Way and they saw some things that were quite unexpected, and this is a picture of what they saw. And so the way I do my film is I start with a still image and I scan it to get the music, that's the sonification, 
So I did that. That was the soundtrack. And then I animated this image. And we can hear both of those. I'll, I'll, start, the, uh, I'll start the film now. And as I said in the thing, I, I scored it for human voices. Just thinking about, we have our human voices down here and we're so small compared to this, but we're so interested in it. And you can see little bits of the thread in there, but I'm approaching this as a poet and an artist. So I take no responsibility for it scientifically. Um, the, the fellow at uh, Northwestern is going to show it to his class as I'm going to finish the film uh, over the weekend. Well, there's the image pretty much without, without being changed. Does that, does that help a, a little bit? Yes, yes, it does. Yeah. And I, I should keep saying that uh, my, my approach to, to putting these two things together I find mathematics that will work for something and sometimes I'm inspired by what they do to make certain things. And, uh, but I'm not really a mathematician. I think the only math class I did well in uh, high school was, uh, was geometry, plain geometry, because I'm a spatial learner. I got straight A's in that, but I almost failed uh, the, other, the other three that I took. And uh, includes, uh, anyway, that, that's a, you know, sort of a personal, but, uh, so I don't, I can't talk to mathematicians, and as I mentioned a couple of times, I'll do something and not knowing quite what it is, and and uh, I'll run into a mathematician. Oh, that's not cross composition, which was a musical thing I thought about. That's con convolution. Well, I'm glad to know that because the description of convolution matches exactly what I was trying to do: take two things, put them together, and make a third thing. Yeah, and that is is in in a way original original work. Gary, you have another question. Uh, yes. Could other project types be transmuted into live performance? Uh, yes. Um, uh, the one that I was doing about um, uh, seated random numbers, I've got my keyboard right here. And I'm playing the keyboard, and it's, each key is triggering a phrase, so you get this this is not a full composition yet, but it's it's an idea. So I could be sitting in a in a bar playing the keyboard and have these things floating around in space. Um, I performed, as I mentioned, with the MIDI horn. I, I toured for over 20 years with the MIDI horn playing live concerts. There were no graphics involved with that, but they were all live interactive pieces with computer programs. So the accompanies for those were not pre-recorded. They were actually things that were being, where, where they, computers were, react, were reacting to what I was doing as a performer. Um, I'd like to get involved more in uh, talking about storytelling. I'd like to get on the road and tell some stories with these things. I've got three of them started and a whole bunch of others that, I, that I'm interested in. And those would be live, except that the movies would be, would be finished and played while I told the story live. You have a comment in chat from Shang Yun Wu. Thank you for the amazing presentation performance. I love the Alexa part. You have a question from Blaine Greiner. Uh, was the chaos algorithm constructed in Max MSP? Yes. How would I go about learning more about constructing and utilizing it in pure data? Uh, oh, in, in another another way. Well, the the, the equation is very, very small. Um, I don't know if I can bring the picture up, but it's x equals r times x times 1 minus x. That's the whole thing. And just by varying r, you get all of this, these different levels of complexity. And that should be easy to, to, to uh, uh, program in almost any language. And then what I'm doing with it, it comes out with these numbers, and the numbers are always between, it's always the value of x, and it's the number between 0 and 1. And then I map that into pitches. So for instance, if I want to play it on an instrument that starts at middle C and goes up two octaves, I would multiply that number by 24 to give me 24 keys. And then I'd add the number 60 to it, which is middle C. 
But another a couple of other things that I, I would do is I might push it through what I call a pitch sieve. And the pitch sieve is you've got these numbers coming out from the mathematics and they go through the sieve. And for instance, in the uh, uh, death and trans uh, uh, transfiguration, the sieve was Strauss's notes. So the notes are coming in for this fractal and it goes and the notes that are playing are in a little box and the note goes in and says, well, what's the note nearest to me? And it comes out and plays that note. So the whole thing from Strauss is superimposed on the numbers that the that that might be made by chaos. But though that one, I can't remember what maybe that was a chaotic fractal. But it was playing rhythms and notes in certain registers with durations and so forth. But it was getting its pitch information all from the Strauss. And in the case of the Cuban one, it was getting it from the uh, Gustav Holst Mars. Gary, you have another one from Aaron, who says, I'm impressed with the range of compositional sounds that you have. Do you have a sense of intuitively sonifying an image? That is, do you get an idea of the sounds that will occur, or is the process one of surprise? Uh, some of it's surprise. The, the uh, Gustav in Havana was, Havana was a, a surprise. I was just kind of noodling around with it, and I just accidentally put the Cuban percussion in, and I, I kept speeding it up and it just got more and more interesting. But it's, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm an intuitive artist. And I like a lot of other things. I sing a lot of Irish music. Um, and I sing, you know, some Leonard Cohen and some other things like that. So I, I, I can't answer the question, what's your favorite music? I just can't answer it. I, I don't see the point to the question. <laughs> In what context? What, right now, what's my favorite one, the one I'm listening to? But uh, yeah, I, well, I, I, as uh, as uh, Susan said in the introduction, I'm a classical, classically trained composer. I didn't get into this stuff until I was almost finished with grad school. Uh, the stuff I did in Holland, I was just I had finished a year of masters before I went to Holland. Then I came back and got a doctorate. So everything that I used to write choral pieces and orchestra pieces and string quartets and things like that. I have a few of those that I didn't, didn't include, but, but they were pretty conventional. But I like poetry, I like theater. I was just gonna uh, just add in a little bit, uh, the, the uh, image that you use for to sonify from my series, the merges, I, I tend to work with a series of surprises. In other words, I have, I have uh, multiple images which which I combine on the on the uh, uh, in the computer, but I don't have a. I I'm beginning to get an idea of what may come out, but I'm always. But I like to work in in the in the area of surprise. I like to be surprised by things. So I was wondering how much you 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 look for that surprise in your process, and how much because the other thing too that I've noticed, at least with with the way I work with visual works, is that if I get very familiar with a algorithm or a process, then I can begin to predict it, or I can begin to start. Yeah, finding but, things. And yeah, I, and I, I, I wanted... think that I think that's a common common approach with with composers and artists. Uh, some of them settle into something that they do for the rest of their life, and it's exactly the sort of thing. And I I've, I've never quite done that. Actually, using the computer in the way I do it 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 opens the door to surprise. I mean, uh, there there are lots and lots of this chaos thing. I I I I, I think I. I stumbled on it. Oh, I think I was sick in 1995 and somebody brought me the book by, I can't remember his name now, The Chaos, The Making of New Science. So I went home and I started programming that and some interesting things started coming out. And, and uh, some things I didn't expect. And uh, what does they say about, uh, I don't know about artists, but re researchers say, research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. And that, that's some of what's going on in that uh, uh, on, on the wanderings thing. It, it has there's a section about um, how early man uh, noticed agriculture, but didn't know what to do with it. They talk about knowing where the berries are at a certain time of year. But when they get there, they notice there's another stand of berries in the same clearing, the same place they used as a toilet before. So we know about the propagation of seeds through through excrement. You you. You know, tomatoes grow where, wherever you dump, and and uh, and and they we did, they didn't have a concept of agriculture, and they didn't have a, even have a word for it. 
And so some of that, that, that 30 minute uh, program started early on and the discovery of knowledge and things like that. Um, there was a section, I, I said it's with jokes and there are some jokes in there. I, I talked about being 100% sure there's life in outer, in outer space, but 99.999 to infinity sure that we'd never meet them because they're too far away and everybody nodded. No, I said, and they're too far away in time too. They may, there, there may not be a sun yet that's formed. And I said, and, and if they did arrive and they came up on our, our front porch and rang our doorbell, they might not be, be bringing a casserole. They know it might not be friendly and everybody nods. And I said, we're not friendly. So there, there was some humor in it, but it, uh, it well, anyway, I, I ramble on about that. that. That's why I needed Allie to keep me in, in tow. More questions? This yeah, we have a question from Kitafan. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thank you very much for the presentation. Could you please share with us about how you sonified the moving image into music or sound? And what is the technique behind that? How did you map it? Uh, yeah, it, was uh, wondering because of a it was described a little bit, but it went by fast. Uh, well, I'll talk about Aaron's image. That, that's, that's Aaron uh, uh, Bielish. Um, I looked at that image and what I saw were gestures. You still see my, my uh, shared screen, it's a background and it has these sweeping things in it. Those are gestures, those are visual gestures. And so I saw gestures in his image. Actually, let me see if I can get back to that. And find it. Oh, I can't, it's too small here. Uh, it's earlier. Oh, here it is. Yeah, so here's here's Aaron's uh, image. And all of those edges I saw as, as musical gestures. And take a good stare at it. Notice these these ovals here in particular and this feature. And so what I did was I did something called a horizontal scan. It's a mathematical thing that just follows the edges. And what it gave me was this. And I think I skipped the part. I, I need a lot of black because black is represents silence. And silence is the, one of the key elements of music. Without silence, we, we don't have music. And so you see those ovals over there on the left. You see the, uh, the outline of the face and the mouth. And so what I did then is I just started scanning that from left to right. There are columns, there are columns in the image. And so I just scanned the column down. And when I found something that wasn't black, I looked at the color, I looked at where it was in the horizontal and the vertical. If it's on the left side of the image or the right side of the image, it's late in the piece. If it's on the, on the left, it's early. If it's high, it's a high note. If it's low, it's a low note. Not, not exactly uh, rocket science. And then the colors determined where it was placed in the stereo space, green on the, on the left, red on the right. There's not a, a lot of red in this one. And then the brightness of the pixels uh, determined how loud it was. And so at any one point, I'm looking at a pixel and I say, okay, it's here, so it's a high note, it's late in the thing, it's green, so it's on the left, it's bright, so it's loud. And then, there, uh, then there are various scales that were attached to that. Uh, th that has to do with the number of rows. If you have a large number of rows, it's microtonal, like uh, fractal, uh, uh, fractal mountains that I described. And then, uh, then I'll play just a little bit of the audio here. And so there's some pitches in a certain range. And that's something that was on the, the, the left in the uh, image I just showed you. And because the gestures move through that acoustic space, you get rising patterns and counterpoint with two lines that sort of intertwine. It's like musical counterpoint. So it's, I think what I more, do more than anything is I try to transfer classically learned musical ideas 
to mathematics and some of these mathematical processes. And I always had have in my mind, there's this mathematics that's coming this way and there's aesthetics coming the other way. And if I hit them they, and they come together and I don't like it and I can't make it better, I just put it aside and go to Lindenmeyer systems or chaos or one of the other things. And the, the evolution, I didn't do these in chronological order, but they've, they've been happening since uh, probably in, since the 70s, 1970s. Early 1970s, I, I, I taught at Purdue and I hooked up with a mechanical and engineer and a computer scientist and an electrical engineer, and they taught me programming and gave me access to the machines and things like that. But for me, it's more of an artistic process than it. it, it I used to have something in there. If we, if you went to a concert in, or to an art gallery and you wondered how the canvas was woven or how the paint was mixed, the art was probably a failure. So when I present this, I don't want people to think about how I did it. <laughs> well, you do have another question. Good. From Shang Yun, who's curious about your Alexa voice and how you designed it for answering questions during the presentation. Um, Alexa, uh, well, it's, I don't know if it's Alexa or not, but uh, Macintosh computer has a built-in speech uh, synthesis program. And you have a selection of voices and Allison is just one of the one of the voices that is in there and the way that you make it happen you go into the uh, systems thing and you set a a, a group of uh, a group of keys and so I, I'm holding down the control option and command key and pressing the letter s and everything I have highlighted oh here uh, just happened to be here okay so I've highlighted some uh, one of the verses of that song Holding down those three keys. There are things we know we know we know and things we know we don't know and things we don't know we And then I can stop her. That. And uh, it's a little artificial. And you learn to, I re, had to respell Varez so that she would say it something close to Varez. Uh, and some of the stuff about uh, Electronische Musik and uh, Musik Konkret, I had to spell them phonetically rather than how they were spelled. And in the uh, the one that was called uh, uh, Shadow Man, I bought that one. There's a place online where you can buy voices for $14 each. And he was called Angry Man, but he had this kind of mysterious voice. When I finish that, I'm going to read the, the script myself. But I was using that synthetic voice so it can really demonstrate what it is. But it's not, now some of these things are pretty simple. That one is, well, it's not simple because it's, it's only simple if you don't know how to do it. If somebody else is doing it, it, it seems simple. But I did learn how to use the speech synthesizer. And uh, somebody mentioned Max and MSP, and that, that, that's a programming language I use a lot. And there was a Japanese fellow that wrote a whole bunch of stuff about speech, uh, things that, that do speech. Um, the one with the granular synthesis, that was just a recording of Dylan. And... Uh, Shall, shall I say again how that works? So you, you've, got a re, you've got a recording and it's making the sound and the granulator, granulator chops it into tiny bits and, the, the, and, and then spreads them a, a, away from the voice in time. And the closer you bring them to synchronize them with the voice, the more intelligent, intelligible it is and the further you get away. And so all I was doing was moving that speech in and out just for dramatic effect. So sometimes when he would come to a key phrase, that would be almost completely intelligible, and then he would drift away to something else. And that was just a gimmick. You know, not, not, I don't think it's a gimmick artistically, but it's, it was something that was fairly easy to figure out. Somebody else wrote the granulator that I use. More questions? I like questions. I'll tell you an anecdote. I was in the library at Oberlin, and I was in an aisle looking for a book, and there were two of my students in the next aisle. And I heard one of my fourth-year students talking to a freshman, and he said, be careful when you ask Gary a question, because he'll tell you more than you want to know. <laughs> well, it's, it's true. 
it's been fascinating, Gary. It's really fun to see to hear about the process as well as you know, it's a pleasure to see and hear everything. Oh. Well, thanks everybody for coming. And I, I just put up on the screen and put in chat information about these laser events for those of you who enjoyed this. There's all around the world. Uh, there are a number of cities that are often associated with universities uh, and other organizations that have been asked to host these and they're all art science related. So it's worthwhile going to leonardo.info and looking at the laser uh, talks page because it's always very interesting. So I just wanted to let you know about that. And I put a link in chat if you want to go there yourself and check it out. And Syrat Santa Fe usually does, uh, usually between four and six each year. And we will have some lasers coming up again soon. So uh, this spring, uh, in association with an exhibition that we'll be doing. So please uh, sign up for SciArt Santa Fe's website at sciartsantafe.org. Uh, and please check out the lasers in Leonardo, the International Society for the Arts, Sciences, and Technology. Do you have any other questions? Would you like to see more about that chaos thing? Anybody like to see that? I'm gonna explain that in a little more detail. Blaine just said, sure. I think Blaine oh. was the one who asked about it and David Garcia, so. Okay. We'll have to okay. take let, me, let me start. Can you see it? Yep. Well, let me start with the graph. Well, let's start with the equation. It's in kind of small right at the top. And it's x equals r times x times 1 minus x. And x is always 0 to 1. The output of the equation, as long as you stay within r equals 0 to 4, it never, never comes out more than 0 to 1. And it just goes back in. And let me get the pointer up here. This graph continues over over here, and it's just not interesting. Well, it's not interesting to me musically, because this line just curves down to value of one, and then it's flat. And I call it the dead zone. So no matter what you put in there, it goes to zero. And then it turns out I can't remember. I'll have to stand up here. And I'm, I'm blocking something. Uh, it looks like this graph is 3.5 uh, to 4 for the value of r as you slide along here. So what happens is that as the r increases, it comes up this line. And if you did this, it would just be one note repeating. But as you move the r, it would just descend, descend, descend to 0. It comes along here. And then at, the, at a particular value, it bifurcates. It splits into two things. And in this area, you're going to get just alternating two notes getting wider and wider apart. And then it bifurcates again. And now there are four notes that would be played. There's a tiny bifurcation in here. And then the bifurcations continue to quit. And then there's an island of simplicity. This is just what happens. So there's a point in here where you just get three notes spread wide apart, and then six notes, and then 12 notes. And then it gets busy again. And when you get out here, it's filling the entire, entire range from, from a zero to one of X. Okay, so let me, uh, let me play it. This little thing is part of Mac, so you can store things. Uh, yeah, let, let, me do the, let me do the percussion, that's, that's kind of fun. So I just turned it on. And now it's, it's down here, which sounds like it's somewhere in this four. There are just a limited number of sounds. And if I move it just a little bit, more sounds, more different. And this is just moving along this axis. get all the way out to four, well, I, I guess I didn't program to four, 3.999. You 
you almost can't hear a pattern. And that's because it's out here in this area where there's so many values for X. And this has a, a musical meaning to me because one of the things you can do to create motion in music is go from simple to complex or, or build up some kind of energy. And variation. And all I'm doing is changing one number in that equation, the value of R. And let me do one here with the, the, the orchestra. And here it is. And let me turn the volume down a minute. So it's playing half the notes, and they're lasting for a four a four beats so that's a that is a a whole note if the beat is a quarter note then this is four times that now let's do something that i'm not sure what it's going to produce but i'm going to tell it to have to type this in uh, i'm going to tell it to last for 12 beats that's three whole notes together and then i'm going to decrease the frequency of notes way down and then I'm just going to have this orchestra start playing. It's not going to be a play very many notes yet. Raise this till it plays. <laughs> Can you, is your volume, volume? Oh, up? my volume is down. Okay. Okay, now. I hear very long notes, some silences. Maybe we need to bring this up a bit. And one word for this in music is texture. How much is happening? Uh, how fast is it going? How, how many notes are there in a particular period of time and I don't know if these are these are widely used but I call what's happening here is horizontal density how many notes are happening in five seconds and then vertical density is once they start how long do they last and so if you if you just draw a line down through the music as it's playing how many instruments are sounding at that point and this chaos thing, when I started using it, it occurred to me that this, you have a very nice control over musical texture. Um, anyway, I, I think that's, uh, th that's a longer uh, a definition of it. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, here, here's another uh, thing that we can do with the percussion. I don't think I did this, but now it's... Okay, you got two drums and a cymbal. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw an X, an X into that, a random X into that equation. And listen, it's going to go away and come back. And it comes back and the nice thing about it it doesn't repeat exactly and this is an aesthetic in music it, it, what, there's nothing boring more boring than something that just repeats and repeats and repeats but th i call this bumping the wagon and then there's an aspect of chaos they talk about the strange attractor okay when i do that it comes back to those two drums and that cymbal and that's a that's a, a byproduct or it's a feature of chaos. Yeah, let me stop this. There, I I, I read the book. Uh, uh, this book, the the guy that wrote it lectured here a couple of years ago. If I can't remember his name right now, but it's chaos: the making of the new art. And they they discovered some of this by watching water flow. You can try this at home. Don't try this at home, but do try it at home. Get your water running from a faucet 
observe how what the pattern is of flow, then change it a little bit, and you'll see the flow react in a funny way, and then come down to another pattern of flow. And that's the strange attractor happening. And they apply this to e economics, uh, to heartbeats. They, they, they've talked about um, arrhythmia, describing, um, uh, simulating arrhythmia with a chaotic equation. But it's it's just the the most the smallest most magnificent thing, and even even mathematical dummies like me <laughs> can turn it into music. Well, it's not so dumb to turn it into music, but understand it to make things. But the, yes, this is written in Max, and I do a, a lot of things in Max. I I do, uh, you know. Uh, well, a number of the things we heard, the one that where I was 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 talking about uh, uh, in the year 2525, that was a Max, was written in Max using Markov chains to compose it, and probably using a seed to figure out how it would, how I could repeat it. Anything else? Too much? I'm quarantined, so I've got no place to go. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Quarantine has been very good for me. For two years, I've had 16-hour days, and <laughs> I, I use about eight or nine of them to do this stuff. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your talking us through all of this, too. It's really fun to learn it in more yeah. detail. But again, when you hear, when you think about science and music, and you go to a concert to a gallery, don't don't worry about how it was made. Okay. Because the the, the the experience of how you, what the composer or artist did to make it was one thing, and what you do to bring it back, the best thing that art does is evoke memories and and thoughts about yourself and and composition we call it the parallel program two people go to a concert same concerts they sit side by side at the intermission they talk about it it made one person happy the other person sad the only place that can come from is your memories and your experiences and that's the one of the, one of the precious things that art does it, it 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 communicates in a way that words can't end of sermon So, good night. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.